Rabbi Lerner is going to come to talk to us on Thursday. Uh, one way you might think about this is that uh, I'm going to be talking about spirituality not in connection with any sectarian orientation. I once asked a Christian friend of mine if I were perhaps a Christian because of my love for Jesus. And he asked me a few key questions and he said, absolutely not. <laughs> so I'm just me. <laughs> and, uh, but jokes aside, he will be coming to the same subject from a, a Jewish perspective and should have some interesting things to say. And he is the founder of an organization called the Network of Spiritual Progressives, which brings spirituality and nonviolence together. So he'll be coming on Thursday. Uh, uh, I want to t uh, tell you about a number of projects that are going on because this is called Nonviolence Today, after all. There is a project afoot which is going to sail a flotilla of ships into Gaza starting from Cairo, Alexandria rather, collecting in Cyprus and then going into Gaza for the purpose of exposing the, what is in effect a blockade of Gaza by the uh, Israeli government. So that is going to start sailing on August 10th. If anybody wants to have a really good time for four or five days and then be in jail for the rest <laughs> of the summer, <laughs> let me know. Um, the, has everybody got this? Let me get this. This is my latest attempt. Peace equals tranquility. <laughs> <laughs> My latest attempt to get the Nobel Prize for something. Um, I mentioned to you that there's going to be this unusual event tomorrow. It's actually taking place next Wednesday. The group that's putting it on is called the Rebuild. Sorry, one second here. Rebuilding Alliance, rebuildingalliance.org. And what they're doing is rebuilding homes that have been wrecked illegally by the Israelis. And the first home that they're going to rebuild in this manner is the very one that Rachel Corey uh, was seeking to protect when she was killed. And so a week from tomorrow, they're going to have a phone conference which will be worldwide and they're hoping to have – well, there are two panelists, myself and a Palestinian psychiatrist by the name of Dr. Iyad al-Saraj, who's very well known in the nonviolence world. We both know him. <laughs> it's my usual joke about the <laughs> expense, expanse of the nonviolence world. Uh, and then about – they want to have about 500 people listening in by some kind of telephone connection. This is a new technology. Uh, it's a new week after all, so it's bound to be a new technology. And if any of you is interested in listening in and then get – sending in some questions, what you do is you go on this website, rebuildingalliance.org, and there'll be a button called register here. Then you register. They give you a phone number. And I think it will be 9 o'clock our time, Wednesday. It will be 7 p.m. in Israel-Palestine. And Dr. Al-Siraj is actually undergoing some kind of treatment. So we may be talking to him in his hospital room or somebody else will be substituting for him. We wanted to have it tomorrow, but there were not enough people. So I'd appreciate it if you would all spread the word. And this should be interesting to try this new technology, see how it works. I think the setup is I talk for 10 minutes, he talks for 10 minutes if he's conscious, and then we'll have discussion and questions. And it's a very good group they're doing. This is in, we, we, as we discussed last week, this is very good nonviolent practice because it's concrete. Ha, ha, ha. That was a pun. <coughs> it's concrete, not just symbolic, and it's constructive and obstructive at the same time. Because they're building homes, very deeply symbolic but not just symbolic. And it's very uh, constructive. But at the same time, what they're doing has been outlawed by the regime that they are in opposition to. So in a way, this is ideal nonviolent technique. 
That, but of course, that's, we're just talking about technique. We have to get into talking about what their attitude is and so forth. Okay, uh, I think that's it. Okay, so the remaining announcement, which I saved for last and which I hope you got on your uh, course web, is the astounding news that this week we are probably getting to the end of something called the Week of Nonviolence in Iraq. So this could be tide turning, that you have people standing forth. It would be not unlike the communities of peace in uh, Colombia. Here you have this maelstrom of conflict with very – like most conflicts, there's much more than two sides involved. And you have a group of people stepping out and saying, no, let's stop the killing. We want nonviolence. No killing of civilians. So at first, for this week anyway, it's mainly a symbolic uh, action. They're hanging out banners and stuff. But in that volatile environment, as a first step, I think that's okay. The question will be, what are they going to do with it? You know, if it succeeds, how do they build on it? If it attracts repression, how are they going to resist and so forth? So I am like Mr. Anti-Symbol. I'm more against symbols than anybody in the entire movement. But I'm okay with this being a symbolic as a startup. Of course, there's – some argue that it doesn't matter whether I like it or not, that there is some sort of objective truth. But I think between now and the final exam, we want to stick with my viewpoint on things. Just kidding. Uh, partly. Uh, <laughs> so, and I also, I think s I sent you out a passage or did you get a passage to look at? Okay. So let me read it slowly and spend a few minutes analyzing it and uh, to re review. The reason that we're doing this is there's going to be a passage on the final exam. And th that's what you're going to do. You're going to analyze that passage. You're going to probably get a choice between two passages. One may be something that you've seen before, but the other one certainly not. And I'll be asking you to read it and tell us what are the assumptions that this person is raising. What are the principles on which he or she is touching, though perhaps hasn't named them. And uh, other comments. Now the point is not going to be to run up to the end of the diving board and take a big spring off into the Empyrean and say whatever you've always been wanting to say about nonviolence. You get to say that on our blog but not on your final exam. The point will be imagine that you are being interviewed on a right-wing radio station, which is almost the, almost the same as saying you're being interviewed on a radio station. And you've been challenged that this person is making this argument and you have to calmly and patiently point out where that, idi uh, where that person <laughs> has, uh, <laughs> has gone wrong. So let me read it. This is from Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cook, who is a very important um, rabbi and intellectual um, in uh, New Israel. And he wrote, with regard to the matter of wars, that is to say whether Jews should fight wars or not, it was simply impossible – meaning not to be warlike – it was simply impossible at a time when the surrounding neighbors were truly a pack of threatening wolves for Israel. Oh, I'm sorry. It was impossible at a time when the surrounding neighbors were truly a pack of threatening wolves for Israel alone to refrain from fighting. For then they could all gather and, God forbid, eradicate the remnant of the Jewish people. To the contrary, it was necessary to instill fear in the wild ones, even with some cruel measures, if only in the hope of bringing humanity to what it should be. Okay, so you've had a chance to look that over in course web and read it through again quickly, this time with the correct uh, parsing of the words. 
With regard to the matter of wars, it was simply impossible at a time when the surrounding neighbors were truly a pack of threatening wolves for Israel alone to refrain from fighting. For then they all could gather and, God forbid, eradicate the remnant. It was necessary to instill fear in the wild ones, even with some cruel measures, if only in the hope of bringing humanity to what it should be. And the surprise about this letter of Rabbi Kook is that it was written in 1904. So I thought it was – when I first saw this, I said I could understand this in 1946, but he wrote it in 1904. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, the floor is yours. The microphone's been turned over to you. Rabbi Kook is sitting there drumming the table and uh, the world is watching and you get to respond. I'm going to keep it very neutral. What would you say? Uh, I purposely started with this passage. I'm going to try to bring one in every day. But I started with this passage because at least it contains one obvious flag that the minute you see it, parts – your mind should be saying tilt, the red flags should be hoisted and you say, wait a minute, I see what's going on there. Okay? But who wants to chime in anywhere? Arby? Okay, he's definitely talking about using threat power to maintain peace. In this regard, he is in about the 98 percent majority of the world. And you remember my quoting an imp a high-ranking military officer in Iraq saying, with enough fear and violence, I think we can convince these people that we're here to help them. So we'd want to just say a couple of words on, about that. Don't be shy. Imagine – okay, I'm going to put you in an even more compelling situation. Imagine you're sitting in the final exam. <laughs> 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 Never mind saving the world. This is about saving your ticket to medical school. Yeah, Elizabeth? Uh, you talked about threat power as being not a thing that we can handle, but also has a very yeah. – um, I mean, it gives only a certain amount of time to work for it and people are going to yeah. do So this is our main objection to – Threat power, it's the work versus work issue for us. You can accomplish some things through threat, but it never in a stable way. Okay, so that's our objection to it. But remember, if we really want to carry people with us, we can't just tell them what's wrong with their stuff. We have to tell them what's right with our stuff so they adopt it. So once the word threat power has been trotted out in this – learned audience, a couple of other things should immediately pop into your mind. Otherwise, you'll have trouble on the IDs. Zoe? Okay, we could also say that, that instilling fear or really almost any other negative, strong negative state in people will eventually lead them to a paradox of repression because they will lash back. And we will be forced to escalate our fear instilling mechanism, our cruelty, whatever they want to call it, until a point where it's no longer tolerable. But let me reel us back to our question. Uh, by this time, I should think that like if you get up in the middle of the night and somebody says threat power, you should immediately come up with two other terms at least. Right. Anyone? Amy? Right. Exchange power and integrative power, a la – who invented these words? Kenneth, Kenneth Boulding. Right. I mean, he didn't invent the words, but he put them <laughs> into, the <laughs> into this construct for us. Right. So you'd want to tell him that if you're having trouble with neighbors, then you have three modes of dealing with them. Threat power, exchange power, and integrative power. And you also probably want to give him fair warning that the choice between threat power and integrative power is uh, ex mutually exclusive, right? You can't say we're going to go mostly with integrative power but a little bit of threat power because then you would be <coughs> pulled over for violating Nagler's law. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So very good. We'd want to go in that direction. But 
so far, this often happens incidentally. The thing that I thought would jump out at everybody <coughs> is still lying there. Uh, Ashley? The dehumanization. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize this before, but um, what it allowed, what you really saw was he was justifying mm -hmm. the, you know, the threat power on the right. dehumanization. When one has to justify themselves, yeah. it in it itself is creating some false agency. Yeah. They're, they're identifying that this is a, yeah. you know, right. Yeah, that's a, that's a sign. If you really uh, want to persuade somebody of something, don't, don't – uh, give with one hand and take back with the other. Don't, don't throw in these justifications. The, it, the word truly was the tip off for that. It truly were ravening wolves. Well, has anybody ever met a Palestinian <laughs> or an Egyptian? Or, you know, uh, I think they're Homo sapiens sapiens actually. So, <laughs> Homo sapiens sapiens musulmanus. <laughs> so they're not. Uh, they're not wolves. And that's why I said they truly were wolves because they truly aren't. So he, he kind of tipped his hand that he himself did not feel very secure about that. But right, this is classic dehumanization. And, and it, it's there primarily to rationalize and whitewash the use of violence against a group. And if, could he one step out behind that – from behind that screen and say, these were human beings, he would not be able to cling to the threat power response. And then he either would have an alternative or he would go into severe cognitive dissonance. <laughs> Catherine? Um, I also thought it was interesting going off of the dehumanization pal at the end that mm -hmm. you said um, that this was a new filter to yeah. the whole whatever. Yes, I had. And yeah. Um, I hadn't noticed that. That's, this is why I like teaching. <laughs> I hadn't noticed that, that he's saying that by dehumanizing them, we'll bring them closer to humanity. But I'm also, I think that he's saying that it'll bring the Israelis closer to humanity by dehumanizing other people. Yeah, yeah, bring the, or bring us closer. Yeah. But the rule of life seems to be, and no nonviolent person can ever forget this, that when you dehumanize another, you are dehumanizing yourself. When you hurt anyone, you're damaging the big picture, as a student of mine said. Or as Martin Luther King said, threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere or something like that. Yeah. So very good. I mean there's more – if you had this actually in front of you in writing and you're sitting there at the final exam and your, your creativity is maxed, uh, there probably would be other things that you could pick up on. But that is the way to go about it. Just immediately, he has just tipped his hand by saying, oh, they really were wolves. Uh, whereas in reality, he has made them into wolves. And what struck me is, given that step, okay, our enemies are not human beings, then everything that he said is true. Once you've dehumanized them, you have no choice. So that's where the error comes in. Yeah, Barbie? Oh, yeah. If it helps you to explain your point at any point in the exam, draw parallels to stuff going on right now or stuff that you have heard of in history, stuff that we've studied. I want you to use the material in the course to back up the arguments that you'll be making throughout the exam. Even on the IDs it might happen. Okay? So as I said last week, we're, we're trying to go a little bit more slowly now in this part of the course. That'll be hard because this is not decaf. But we're trying to go a little bit more slowly to give you more time to bring up questions, especially because we'll have Rabbi Lerner here on Thursday and he's a very dynamic speaker. So we may have only next Tuesday for a flat out, no holds barred reviewed review. So if something comes up for you, the ID list or anything, I think we're going to be very tolerant towards interruptions. But I, we also have a guest here from uh, Europe who would like to say a few words about the very topic that we're talking about. So I'd like to try to get through my remarks uh, reasonably.
quickly so we can do all of these things. Um, okay, so the topic is what is the connection between spirituality and nonviolence? And you have probably gathered by now that for me these are two sides of the same coin. You know, this is like what Gandhi said about truth and nonviolence. It's a coin with two heads, as it will, as you, uh, if you will. Neither really could be privileged over the other. And in practical terms, that means if you cling to truth, you will get to nonviolence. At the same time, if you insist on being nonviolent, you will get to significant truths about life. And that's why he was once. Uh, he had a Bengali scientist working for him who claimed to be agnostic, if not atheist, said he didn't believe in anything. Gandhi challenged him one day and said, Nirmal, y y you don't believe in anything? And he said, uh, well, I believe in truth anyway. And Gandhi said, that will do. <laughs> that really be, that's really the whole thing. So similarly for me, we in the world today, in the in especially in the industrialized world, are passing through what can only be called a spiritual crisis. And uh, it was none other than Rabbi Lerner who eight days after – nine days after 9-11, we had a huge meeting, a teach-in a la Berkeley in Wheeler Hall. And the, the place was packed. It was almost 900 people. And everyone was talking about, you know, bombs and what religions of people got killed. And he said, look, let's face it, this is a spiritual crisis. To my I, I, I completely agreed with him, but to my surprise, the whole audience rose to his feet in spontaneous acclamation. So I think what we've got here is something that's underneath the surface of our minds. That we know – we sort of know, but we don't admit to ourselves and we don't have a way of talking about it that we're passing through a very deep crisis that has to do with who we think we are, what we think will make us happy, and our relationship to one another at the very least. And it's very confusing because in our emptiness and hunger for spirituality, when we reach out to gratify that hunger, to fulfill that need, we get very, very poor guidance about where to turn. And some people go, you know, really off in the wrong direction. We'll talk about that again in maybe in a little bit. So as I say, nonviolence and spirituality are just different doors to the same room. Uh, you can't have materialism, and by that I mean material – materialism as a philosophy and as, a, as an economy and as a way of life. You cannot have materialism without having violence if that materialism goes on too long. And ours has gone on way too long. Um, for reasons that I've mentioned from time to time, primarily because of the mass media which have locked us into a materialistic culture and a materialistic paradigm which I think would have been dead 150 years ago if it were not for the invention of television. And I will again remind you about this uh, BBC film. Let me make sure I get this right. Hayoka Magazine dot com has a – six-part PBS – BBC <laughs> uh, series – it was BBC, I guess, before it was PBS, if it was PBS – on Edward Bernays, uh, the nephew of Sigmund Freud. Uh, the series is called Happiness Machines. And it, the, it says, this series is about how those in power have used Freud's theories to try to control the dangerous crowd in an age of mass democracy. But it's really about much more than that. It's about how the techniques of advertising were used on the one hand to build up fascism in Europe and on the other hand to build up corporatism in America. Okay? And as you know, 
your friend and mine, Benito Mussolini, said we don't even need the word fascism. You might as well just say corporatism because it's the same thing. So that's the downside, okay? That's, this is as bad as it gets for today. <laughs> this, if you want to know <laughs> how we got stuck in a materialist culture and how it works, go ahead and watch that PBS, uh, BBC film. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> it's a good film, whoever made it. Um, and as I've, as I've argued here a number of times, but if you think for too long that machines are going to make you happy, you eventually come up with the idea that you are a machine. And then you're locked into this world of scarce material resources. So conflict is very likely. And you're in a world where conflict is allowable because you're not killing anybody. You're just killing other things. And we've seen many examples of this, how people get themselves into a virtual mentality disconnected with reality. And the next thing you know, they're going on a rampage and killing people because they're not real to them. So uh, that's why a significant element of the revolutions that are going on have at last, and I think this is a very good thing, have at last recognized that culture is the problem. And somehow or other, we've got to break out of the one we've got and build a new one. And of course, my preference is you primarily build a new one. Most of the old one falls away by itself, and what's left is easy to mop up. That's the constructive program approach. So you have, for example, a magazine comes out of Canada called Adbusters, which just helps people break up their fascination for advertising. Which is not to say that we in the peace movement are above using advertising techniques to get our message across. I have no problem with that. Um, and you have a concept. This actually should be on the list of IDs. Two concepts, really. One is called cultural violence, which talks about two things. It talks about the imposition of your culture on another society. As a f one of the, you talk, we talk about direct violence, structural violence, and today we've started talking about cultural violence, uh, which we're very good at uh, here in America. And then there's also this concept of culture jamming, which means getting in the way of the messages of the mass media culture so people can liberate their minds and recognize that some of the things that they like fit into a coherent pattern of ideas and a, a pattern of living. Um, uh, however, as we've seen many times, I, I'm, I'm keeping my radar switched on, by the way, so if you have any, any questions, I'm willing to stop this uh, verbal rampage at any point. Catherine? <laughs> Culture jamming means putting out messages that in some way break up the compelling message of the mass media. So, for example, mm, <laughs> I'm thinking of this, uh, this ad. It's, you look at it and you, you immediately think you're seeing a Marlboro ad, but you don't see the word Marlboro. But these two cowpokes are loping along out there on the prairie, the tumbling tumbleweed and all of the rest of it, strumming on their guitars. <laughs> and one of them says to the other, I miss my lung, Bob. So it's, it's really, here you have Ed, Edward Bernays saying, let's get women to smoke. This is the torch of freedom. That starts the culture. And this culture jamming means breaking up the cultural message that, you know, light up, light up an unlucky strike. You know, I've seen very, very funny things done to camel ads, which are very vulnerable to this sort of thing. But most of them are not suitable for mixed company, especially when they're being webcast. So, <laughs> so culture jamming is just, it's a general term, I guess. As I say, a lot of these terms are so you knew that people maybe use them in different ways. But it's a deliberate attempt to get in the way of the cultural message that we are separate, physical, 
violent creature, so forth. Okay. And this can be a lot of fun, actually, <coughs> in addition to being a very valuable thing to do. However, uh, we need to add that <coughs> once again, as we've seen many times, uh, it is essential, unfortunately, to build these etern al build alternatives, and how you build an alternative culture is very unclear. And moreover, it has to be done offline, as you've seen over and over again. You can. I remember once being asked to be on a panel by a prominent television station in San Francisco. You can imagine how excited I was, which was my downfall. <laughs> they, they said, would I be willing to talk about the university? And I said, <laughs> where's that microphone? Where's that camera? You know, bring the bill cream, you know. Um, uh, and they said, okay, well, what will be your approach? So what I did was I started from their topic, which was some very narrow specific topic about something this university is doing right here. And I enlarged the picture step by step. I said, you know what? It's not just the humanities. It's the entire campus. And you know what? It's not just our campus. It's the whole university system. And you know what? It's our whole culture. Well, it was extremely interesting to watch their response. Every step bigger that I took, they got smaller. Until finally, when I got to the end, they said, we can't use you. <laughs> end of invitation. So that was, that was a blow to uh, the ego and, and, all the, but, and all the rest of it. But it was a very valuable lesson that the media have locked themselves into being the media. And the, the temptation is, oh boy, we've got the truth. Let's go on Fox News and broadcast it to millions of people. No se puede. It is not going to happen. Uh, Oprah gets closer than anybody else, but then she has to sacrifice a lot to even get that close. So I say, you know, why regret? No use crying over spilt milk. Let's deal with the cards we have. Let's play with the cards we've been dealt. Gambling vocabulary is a little bit weak here. Uh, yeah, we've been dealt a certain deck or whatever you say. Let's play with it. We cannot get – we cannot change the mainstream within the mainstream, by and large. You know, there may be some openings, by and large. And we should be prepared. Um, toward the end of the free speech movement, there was a full page out in Time magazine. Struck me very forcibly. I read it over the shoulder of one of my colleagues on an airplane. It showed a picture – of Plato, actually it was half Plato and half um, Che Guevara. And you know, there was a beard on one half, there was Plato on the other half. And you know, half a flak jacket and half a, a, a chitone. <laughs> and it said, okay, okay, it said. You've taken over the dean's office. Which we shouldn't do that anymore. <laughs> you've uh, got the university. You've shut down this, that, and the other thing. Now what do you want? And you know what? It was very – arresting to see that because we had fought for months and months and months to get their attention. And then when we got it, we didn't know what to do with it. So we should be ready at a moment's notice. If somebody said, you're going to be on uh, Face the Nation tomorrow, or if, assuming that program still exists, or, <laughs> or you know, Face the megachurches, <laughs> whatever you face these days. Uh, tomorrow we, should, uh, we shouldn't say, ha ha, where were you ten years ago when I wanted to be on your program? No, I'm not going to play. We should have our bullet points – sorry, we should have our, our whatever they are, our flower points <laughs> <laughs> ready to go. Yes, okay. Daisy, Petunia, Gladiolus, whatever they are. <laughs> but at the same time, here's the trick. I think it's quite essential for us. It can't be quite essential. It's either essential or it's not. Okay. It is essential for us not to be depending on the mass media. Not to say we're sitting here with our message and nobody's listening. You have to do it and articulate it and eventually you will be heard or you won't be. But you, you do your thing anyway. Um, now, 
we're going to be kind of looking at this question of rebuilding and a spiritual culture in terms of levels. And the deepest level is that the energy and the wisdom for recapturing a sense of spirituality has to come from individuals. That's been one of the most difficult things for us to get oriented to. Americans are fantastically good at organizing stuff. Uh, when Swami Vivekananda came to this country in the 1900s, during the turn of the century, he was very, very popular. He was extremely handsome. He was this tall, strapping Bengali, spoke about eight languages fluently. And I don't, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but he was very, very attractive. He was drop-dead gorgeous, as we say nowadays. <laughs> And he came home to his host's house one day and he said, I have seen something today that I want very much. I want to have it and I want to bring it back to India. And his hosts said, oh, what's her name? And he said, no, no, you don't understand. He said, I am a monk. He said, what I have seen here today is organization. And uh, so this is the interesting thing. You have this civilization which incredibly good values, deep contact with spirituality and no concept of how to organize it. And 6,000, 9,000 miles away, you have this other culture with incredibly good organizing skills and absolutely no idea what they should organize. So somehow getting these two things together could be, um, what do you say? You don't say dynamite. Uh, it could be, <laughs> could be fertilizer or I don't know, something like that. It could be very, very uh, – could lead to a very rapid change. It could be a tipping point. Um, so uh, I think that's – this is why I've been saying that what we should be thinking about is not necessarily a different kind of people in power, but a different kind of power in people. So at the first level – from which this is going to be generated has to be from individuals. It has to be something there to organize before we organize it. And you might say that um, faced with this material crisis, people are having different reactions. I think I'll go ahead and write this on the board. And it's – breaking the country up into different groups. And there's a very large group that says, why worry? You see pictures of them. They look sometimes slightly caricatured to look like prominent elected officials. But uh, they're saying, what's, what's wrong with materialism? Look, we've got 80 percent of the country is able to have three meals a day. 2% is fantastically wealthy and only 18% is starving in the street. What's the problem? Um, and of course, part of the problem is that these are people who are living isolated from the past and isolated from the future. They are not interested in the wisdom of the past and they're not interested in what's going to happen when we run out of the resources that they're gobbling up. But they're a very large group. And uh, in reaction to that, and at first it didn't seem like it was opposite of this, but it is, you have an evangelical movement which is, you know, in some cases I think an excellent thing. It's right on target. I'm thinking of people like Jim Wallace and Sojourners. But a point that I want to get to here is that because of the problem I mentioned before where we vaguely know that we need spirituality but we have almost no idea what it is. You reach out for the next best thing and that to a lot of people that says religion. So you start meeting in storefronts and things like that. We spent a lot of time last semester pointing out how deeply ambiguous religion as an organization becomes. And how, you know, for the first three centuries, you remember my model, the devolution, where you start with a revelation and then an adaptation and finally a co-option. And it's all gone except for the prestige. 
and then it becomes very dangerous. So you have all of these sort of new age formats and some of it has spiritual consciousness and some of it does not. So uh, maybe I'm being prejudicial here. I'm just kind of telling things like I think they're at. But you have this tremendous explosion that happened here in the late 60s and the early 70s. And part of it was very silly. When my spiritual teacher – my spiritual teacher had an interesting experience because he came here to Berkeley in 1960. In 1962, he had to go back to India. So in 1962, I was on this campus. You, if you had seen me, uh, I, I didn't have much of a beard, only just a little bit to show that I had come from Greenwich Village. <laughs> and every day I wore a sport coat and a tie. That's how we came to school. And I was interviewed by the Daily Cal one day. And they said, how come you have a beard? And we had this long interview about it. At the end I said, I'm not the only, camp the only one on campus that has a beard, am I? And they said, no, we got the other two guys yesterday. So, <laughs> so that's the scene that he left in 1962. He comes back in 1966. The place is reeking of patchouli oil. <laughs> there's, this, <laughs> there's beads all over the place. It's, you know, the summer of love, the fall of love, the winter of love, the spring of love. <laughs> the music is different. The behaviors are different. Well, they're not really, but they're just being called something else. And uh, the appearance of everything is totally different. And uh, students are insisting that we teach courses on yoga and meditation and things like that. And so there's this explosion. But as I say, part of it was very silly. And at one point I remember hearing Ishran say, if one more person comes and tells me that he achieved samadhi in Golden Gate Park last Saturday, <laughs> I am going back to India. <laughs> <laughs> but it was an effort and it was an attempt to get at something and you know, th this is how first efforts work. So I'm cutting these people a lot of slack. Um, oh, I, I guess this actually isn't what I meant to say. Sorry. I meant to put the New Age phenomena up here. And I don't think this little scheme is terribly important, but New Age phenomena here and religion down here as a whole other response. Anyway, I should tell you at least a little bit what I mean by spirituality before I turn it over to your questions and our guest uh, speaker. Um, basically, where I'm coming from is to say that spirituality is awareness of the unity of life. It's really, in a way, it's that simple. And so you can immediately see the convergence with nonviolence. Now, uh, to be aware of the unity of life in the deepest sense of the word, is extremely rare. I, I think you know, Gandhi was there, but as one, one person said while he was still alive, God sends a Mahatma Gandhi once every thousand years. You know, give or take a few hundred, that's, that's probably it. So what are the rest of us going to do if we want to be nonviolent and we want to somehow get out of way of overcoming that hunger that materialism has imposed? You can think of it not as the unity of life on an absolute spiritual sense, but the interconnectedness of life. So that would be enough to get us started. If, if you have a sense that life is interconnected, you'll begin to hear the absurdity of saying with enough terror and violence, we'll convince these people that we're here to help them. And the absurdity of always trying to win a uh, win-lose ending out of every situation and the absurdity of ending up saying we had to destroy the village to save it, that will be enough. And then at least in terms of behavior, if you're behaving as though you are interconnected with others and you're open to the idea that there may be more to life than the material level, I think realistically you're on your way towards being able to rebuild the culture on a spiritual basis. So those two things fit together. So, uh, yeah, Zoe. 
Uh, let me try to repeat the last thing I just said. We may have to rewind the tape on this one, but I think what I said was if you are acting on this basis that life is an interconnected whole and you're open to the idea that life consists of much more than the material basis that we're aware of. So in other words, you're not just bodies and I have a way of reaching you, which does not me – means I do not have to waterbo waterboard you in order to get you to change your mind about something. That I can approach – oh, and I guess the third thing I said was if you are willing to try to get out of the habit of approaching every interaction as though it had to be a win-lose outcome, you know, at least entertaining the possibility that it could be a win-win outcome. If you do all those things and you're willing to learn from your own experiences, I believe you will get to a place where you are practicing principled nonviolence and you are on your way towards having a spiritual outlook in your life. The rest is a very personal matter, so that's why I can't you know, say much more about it. So people have to find a spiritual practice that works for them, but I'm not convinced that that can be done on a mass level. I wish I were. I remember somebody saying to me, we have 35,000 people meditating every morning in San Francisco. They have entered the fourth state of consciousness. I said, look, I said, I can be kind of hard-nosed about things like this. I said, look, if we had 35 people, not 35,000, if we had 35 people in San Francisco who had reached the fourth state of consciousness, you would not recognize the Bay Area or California or the United States and all the rest of it. So I don't know exactly why I'm saying that, but it certainly sounded <laughs> impressive. <laughs> I, th I think what I'm saying is you really this is th – we've said what we can say about the necessity of contacting spirituality within us. It has to come from that individual level, but there's not a whole lot that we can usefully say about it beyond this point. So where do we go from there? This is like the person power level. Okay, let's move on to the people power level. And what can we say? And here I'd like to throw out an interesting idea for you people, uh, and that is – We've discussed uh, this year and especially this semester a lot of interesting innovations that are supportive of, if they are not actually themselves, a spiritual culture. A culture that's based more on interconnectedness and unity than it is on competition. That's based more on non-physical gratification than it is on physical gratification. So there are things that people are doing that signal to the world the possibility that there could be another basis for fulfillment and happiness. These things are very important. They can be much more influential than you think. Uh, when I was quite young we – don't, we don't need to talk about the numbers here – but <laughs> when I was quite young, I was on the fringes of the beat generation. And uh, I fancied myself quite a beat actually. I bought a motorcycle and all the rest of it. Um, but <laughs> we thought that our whole thing – I shouldn't really use the first inclusive first person plural. They thought that they were so far out of society that they could not possibly influence people and they weren't even trying. And the next thing you know, Elements of that culture were absorbed very rapidly into a very straight-laced, bourgeois, mainstream culture. And you people and I, we're sitting here a lot more comfortably than we would have if that hadn't happened back then. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is uh, let's not deprecate the influence of innovative mechanisms that are based on a different concept, a different assumption about life. If they work, people who are desperate without realizing it to get out of the prevailing culture may seize on to these things. So mention some of them. What are some of the things that we've discussed maybe recently that uh, 
Okay, you don't have to be illumined to be doing these things, but if we could get them to work, they would fit into a whole different pattern of living than what we've got now. I know I do this to you people. Sometimes I get on a roll and I'm laying out the stuff and you, you go into a kind of stunned passivity. <laughs> Amy? <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. You can practice nonviolent communication even if you haven't gotten into the fourth state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. But in various ways, this is a practice which resonates with very different assumptions about the human being. Uh, go back to our little statement that we started off with, our little paragraph from Abraham Isaac Cook. You're surrounded by ravenous wolves who want to devour the remnant. Put that side to side with what Amy just reminded us of. Can you imagine being in a cage with a rad ravenous wolf and saying, what are your real needs? <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, if you're the Buddha, you could do that. So, you know, you're hungry? Here, take it. I don't need this body. I've had thousands of them. <laughs> but I think for the most of us, we cannot go about solving conflict on that basis. And if you practice nonviolent communication, the underlying assumption is that everybody has a point of view. The minute you assume that everybody has a valid point of view, which is valid in the way that human points of view are valid, not absolutely valid, but valid for them. That if you can reach them at the place of validity for them and get them to a point where they can hear your validity, uh, you can then move to a rational and non-dash violent mode of conflict resolution. Okay? So the very uh, – basis of nonviolent communication is nonviolent in another way. It was this needs business. You remember what they say about needs versus strategies? That should have rung a bell with us. Anybody? Okay, let me uh, put this out there as a trick question. Uh, I, I, I really get down to what my basic needs are. And I, I go to Ashley, for example. She gets down to her basic needs and uh-oh, they're in conflict. Comment on that hypothesis, hypothetical situation. Billy? <coughs> really, this is absolutely fundamental ah, – sorry, there I go again. This is fundamental <laughs> – you can't be partly fundamental. This is fundamental for nonviolence that – the world is so organized that there cannot be real existential unavoidable conflict on the level of needs. It will only be on the level of perception. And therefore, if you can change a person's perception, hey, conflict, end of conflict. So that's a, uh, that's a faith position that in the nonviolent framework. So if you go about resolving conflict on that basis, you're signaling to people that this hypothesis might be correct. Now, I don't know if I've told you this story, but Marshall Rosenberg, who invented all of this stuff, he doesn't just do it on the one-on-one -on -one level the way Mickey Kashtan did it with us. He was called in to moderate, mediate a conflict in Africa somewhere. It was very, very bitter, feudal, tribal stuff going on. And he gave his workshop. It was all being translated into two or three languages. During the break, elderly gentleman came over and leaned across the table and was shaking his fist and yelling at him in some language he didn't understand. He tried to remain calm. When the person got to the end of his tirade, he turned to his translator and said, what did he say? He said, if you had come here six months ago, we would not have had to have this war. So this stuff um, – really does work and as people get attracted to it and notice that it works, they will consciously or unconsciously, depending on if they have a PhD or they don't, they will <laughs> consciously or unconsciously assimilate the hypothesis on which it's based. 
and that will get us started on the idea that we're much more deeply interconnected than we thought and competition is unnecessary and harmful. We'll be on our way. Okay, other things. Other mechanisms. Yeah, Zoe. Wow. I mean, I look at my watch. Uh, how does this influence a paradigm shift? Uh, I guess I would have to say in mysterious ways. Um, we know some things about how paradigm shifts happen and others we don't. Um, we, we know this tipping point model is important and that means that key individuals – can precipitate dramatic change because whether they realize it or not, a whole node of other individuals which could reach into the hundreds is looking to them. You wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily see it but uh, in Malcolm Gladwell's book he talks about somebody who discovered a good restaurant. This is in the days before there was email. He immediately went home and fired off a hundred faxes saying go to this restaurant. Now Gladwell is of course only interested in commercial tipping points but we're interested in the kind of tipping points that television stations don't want to hear about, you know, deep cultural ones. Um, so I guess what we've said so far is that these mechanisms like nonviolent communication and others I'm going to ask you to mention, they signal the possibility of a whole different conception of what human beings are, i.e. a different paradigm. By signaling that conception, to take another term now from the commercial world, you have what are called early adopters. Some people will look at this and say, glong, I got it. You know, how many people <laughs> watched how many chimpanzees reconciling after a fight and walked away without having any response at all. And finally, one person, partly because he's Dutch, Franz Dual, he's standing there in Arnhem Zoo and he sees them getting over a fight and he says, Dek ken ik begrijpen. I understand this. <laughs> uh, these animals are practicing reconciliation. So he rushes to the library to look up. He's expecting to come staggering home with a huge pile of books on animal reconciliation and guess what? Neats, there's nothing out there. Nobody's written a word. So Franz de Waal is an early adopter. So that's another thing that we know about how paradigm shifts happen. Um, I I've had this experience many times. I think I told you a little bit about this experience in Tamales High School. I went in and I talked to about 65 Teenagers, I would say uh, 20 of them were, if I may use the 1960s expression, 20 of them were turned on by the concept of nonviolence. Uh, about 10 or 15 of them were infuriated, which means they'll be turned on the next time. <laughs> and the rest of them uh, kind of on them. You know, they had no idea what I was talking about. They kind of hoped that the bell would ring and they could go back to playing very aggressive football. <laughs> and that's how it is with every group. So uh, I think it's very difficult to predict which groups are going to have more early adopters than others. It's a funny thing. It's just a, it more, again, we get back to individuals. Okay. So how about uh, other institutions that we've – touched upon that could be uh, forerunners in the sense that they make sense in a, in a world that has a spiritual basis, that has a different paradigm and they don't make sense in the world we've got right now. I Josiah? Know. Yeah, International Fellowship of Reconciliation in the sense that they do what? They bring together people of different faiths and different backgrounds. Okay, in their own internal structure, they're inclusive which right away means that they could be building us a unity and diversity paradigm and not an exclusionist paradigm. So right away that's something. And then of course the work that they do 
is to do reconciliation in conflicts and to put people uh, as third parties in conflict areas and all of those things. Yeah. Imagine if Rabbi Cook had said, we were faced with a difficult situation. We're surrounded by people who hate us, not by hungry wolves, surrounded by people who hate us, and we have two choices. We can wall ourselves in so they can't <coughs> hurt us even if they want to, or we can talk to them and get them to stop hating us. You know, I'm thinking about one person who, uh, in this very early period, before 1946, he was told – he's an Israeli – he was told, don't go into this, this certain area. I'm trying to think of his name. He's a wonderful early peacemaker. He'll come to me. He was told, you know, the Arabs are very angry. Don't go in that area. He immediately went in there, found himself surrounded by a bunch of what will later be called Palestinians. They're basically Jordanian <laughs> Arabs at this point with rifles and they said, we're going to have to kill you. We don't allow any Jews out here. So he said, uh, oh, okay, how did you have in mind doing this? <laughs> and they were a little startled by that response and they conferred. He spoke fluent Arabic, by the way. They conferred and they said, well, we thought we would throw you down a well. And he said, oh, okay, uh, is there a well nearby that you would like to throw me down? And they, they said, um, yeah, yeah, there is uh, over there, starting to kind of lose heart over the whole thing. And he trotted over to the well and said, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm hamming it up a little bit. <laughs> Instead of coming and pushing him into the well, they're talking and talking and talking. And finally they came over and they said, would you repeat something after us if we said something to you? And he said, of course I would. And they said, uh, uh, I'll – how does it go? Allah, 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 Muhammad, Rasul, Allah. Said, Would you repeat that? And he repeated it and they said, yay, you're a Muslim. We don't have to kill you now. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they weren't even – they didn't even look like wolves. <laughs> I mean, they were actually real people. So anyone who's practicing, whether it be third party or not, practicing communication instead of – force and threat power is signaling this. Um, so I would put all of this at a kind of second level. They're innovative institutions where, okay, maybe you don't have intense spiritual energy moving through them, but you have the formats in which spiritual energy could move through them and they're ready to awaken people. So when you awaken enough of the right people, you're on your way. And thirdly, we dealt with the question of could you somehow organize the whole world along lines which would allow people to flourish spiritually. I think that's the most that we can ask. And I'd remind you that Johann Galton's definition of violence is anything that inhibits the fulfillment <coughs> of a person. And if you carry that out to the spiritual level, if you inherit, inhibit people's spiritual fulfillment, you're doing spiritual violence to them. And our world does that a lot. Could we build a whole world order model with economic, political and other structures in it that at least wouldn't do this to people? And at that point, I'm just going to leave that an open question. Right? When you write your paper on it, write a book on it, <laughs> give a speech at the UN, <laughs> whatever. I'll give you a chance to think about this on the final if you want to, if you like thinking about that sort of thing. So I'm going to take three minutes now, Egon, if that's okay, to uh, just talk, have questions, if there are any. And then could you come up and to give us your – yep. So anybody have any questions about this or actually at this point we're going to start entertaining questions about anything we talked about all semester. <laughs> okay. So everybody has memorized everything and it all makes perfect sense. We're all A okay.
I'm, I'm perfectly okay with waiting a minute on this if uh, – yeah, Nicholas. Uh, Uh huh. I I didn't actually s use the beat generation as an example of nonviolence. Um, they were not violent most of the time in the sense that they were too stoned. But <laughs> but I I didn't use them for that reason, Nicholas. And no, I don't think that psychedelic drugs are a good way to become nonviolent. Uh, I the <laughs> what I. <laughs> I, I've said a lot of things that are probably illegal, immoral, or fattening, but at least that one I don't have to say. Um, I use them as an example of, an, of a group which could not have been more marginalized. You know, the, is there a, they were, it's like they were asking themselves, is there a way that we can be more weird? <laughs> and if anybody does something, I'm not going to do it. Um, so, and yet, as a reaction, they held up a mirror of possibility to people who were desperately, desperately bored and unhappy with the life that they were living and gave them a reason, an excuse to bust out of that life. There's a movie about this, about a lawyer in Los Angeles who suddenly becomes a hippie and I, <laughs> I forget what it's called. But that's all that I was using them as an example for. And no, I think if nonviolence is clinging to truth, then the psychedelic experience is, um, I think, at the very best, an extremely limited vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. My opinion, in my opinion, there really is not a correlation between hallucinatory experiences and experiences of reality. R why people think there is is that hallucinatory experiences are different and mystical experiences are different. Therefore, logically, <laughs> hallucinatory experiences are mystical experiences. But I don't think so. It would be part of maybe a longer discussion, but I mean the short answer is I think you're departing from normality in opposite directions. Yeah. So dare to say no to mushrooms. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to have more chances I hope on Thursday and definitely on Tuesday. So please, I'm about to turn it over to you, Egon, please look over um, – your notes and the ID list that I handed out, remember the final exam is going to have IDs, maybe a couple more than you had on the midterm. Then there will be a passage for analysis and then there will be essays. So I strongly recommend you get together in groups to study the way law students do and look how much money they make. <laughs> just, just kidding. So uh, Berkeley – uh, Institute of uh, in International and Area Studies has a collaborative rela relationship with a university in northern Germany called the University of Fechta, which uh, invited me there for a speaking tour some years ago. And I am now in a collaborative publishing relationship with my colleague, Dr. Spiegel. And when he heard about today's topic, he said he wanted to say a few words or could say a few words about it. So. I'm going to invite him up to do that. And he may need some help. Come to Hungarian. He may need some help with English, so I'm going to try to do that also. Oh, let me give you this. Okay. Put that in the pocket. Michael, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity uh, to talk about my uh, persuasion and my position on uh, the combination of spirituality and uh, practice of nonviolence. 
I think uh, nonviolence is not uh, postulate but a consequence. And I, I will show you uh, by giving uh, skits, uh, I will paint it uh, to the table. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, and I will uh, make a polar polarization of two constellations. Um, the one uh, constellation, uh, I, I could paint it uh, like this. At the one side is one person or a party. Um, and uh, this party um, um, uh, is willing is willing to do violence, and the and the other party too. This is a normal uh, situation: two parties, two persons, in a, a constellation of violence. And uh, this is uh, a constellation you can ch you can choose. The other constellation is this one: one person or one party. It's the same uh, situation, and uh, the other person who is doing this um, put down the arms. <laughs> Hat. <laughs> <laughs> Two. And, uh, but what is, the, what is the conditions of this constellation? The uh, condition of this constellation is that there must be a third, a third, what, what? A third power, a power of might, uh, a might, power, and the name for this is in the term, term, term myology of uh, Gandhi. Satyagraha. It means the might of uh, truth or the power of truth. In another um, t term, terminology, perhaps the terminology of uh, Carl Rogers, it means the constructive potential. And uh, in the Jewish language, it could be uh, be or to be. There is something. There is something. I cannot. I cannot um, um, define d d define it. I can only say there is something. And the name for this is. And the Jewish people um, don't uh, don't spell it or don't 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 spell don't spell it out. Yes, and uh, I will uh, uh, I will do this like the Jewish. I, I don't want to spell it out, but uh, it means translated. There is something, and uh, the Jewish people uh, like to say not more than this, and this is the main point. Uh, and and the um, and the question to uh, to all of us: What is my st my status confessionis in, in in Latin? Status confessionis. Where do I stand spiritually? Yes, uh, it, is this my this my uh, position or or this? The question is: How deal it with the number three? What is three? If there are a third might, if there are a third power for me, Ex exists this power for me. And I think this is the basic, the basic of, uh, of nonviolence. And uh, you cannot, you cannot uh, be nonviolent only on the basic of this constellation. And uh, if, you say, if, you, if you can say to this constellation, and if you can say to, uh, to the three, uh, third uh, power, <coughs> nonviolence is a consequence and not a postulate. And the, um, 
die, die Haltung, eine, eine Haltung, die man einnimmt. The attitude of this is described in, uh, in um, following uh, um, terms. In Hebrew, it means he mean. The important uh, Buchstaben letters are M and N. And you know this word. This word um, you can find in Amen. It's the same. Every time you say amen, you means I trust in. This means, he mean means to trust in, not to believe. To believe is not the same like to trust. It's a, it's a very sh uh, starkest word. It's, it's a, a strong word. It's a strong word, he mean. Uh, uh, it, um, it means I trust in, I, I bow and auf, I stand in. To trust in, to stand in. Uh, to stand in what? To stand in this. And this, if this, <laughs> the consequence, and therefore nonviolence is is um, a, a consequence of to trust in to he mean in Yahweh, mm -hmm. in my Christian uh, ter terminology, it it means God. And um, in the Christian uh, word, the, the consequence would be. To God. I learned it from Carter Hayward. An, 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 uh, Hayward. an Anglican uh, theologian. Yes, this is in um, the heart of my uh, lecture uh, on, uh, on nonviolence, uh, summarized in only uh, one uh, picture. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I think the, uh, really the main point is to uh, make a difference between this symbol, constellation of life and conflict and conflicts, and this uh, complex constellation and uh, the was heißt entsprechend in the adequate corresponding. the corresponding um, attitude. Yeah. Could I say something about this? <laughs> here, <laughs> we're used to this. Come on over here. Uh, you may remember when we were talking about third parties that I said that this is the significance of a third party is to reflect back to the individuals something of which they've become unaware. So the third party is not there just as a person, but as representing this attitude of trust in something that's bigger than the situation of two conflicting parties. So in a way, this number three is in both of these parties. But or they've, between. it's, or between. But, well, for me, primarily it's within. Mm -hmm. But it's hidden. It's hidden from themselves. And so what the third party does is reflect it back to them. So to wake, awaken it up in them when you have a third party. OK, well, there's Professor Spiegel's whole life in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Michael. You're welcome, Megan. <laughs>